Okay, so I'm here today to talk to everyone about your most favorite thing, legacy code. <laughs> no matter where you are on your software engineering journey, whether you're a newbie or seasoned developer, you are going to encounter legacy code. It's not a case of if, it's when. It can be really overwhelming, though. Legacy code is horrible. When you see it, it just confuses you. You don't know what's going on. It's just, yeah, horrible. No one, yeah. OK, so today I want to talk to you about a lot of tactics to help you tame the beast that is legacy code. Now, hopefully, you can start viewing it as an asset to your company and not just something horrible. So first of all, I want to talk what exactly is legacy code. There are a few definitions for legacy code. And uh, so legacy code, in my view, is any code that you didn't write just now, and I mean within the past five minutes, OK? Like, it becomes legacy pretty much immediately. It could also be code that's resulting from incorrect assumptions, code that was built using unsupported technology, for example, PHP 5.6 now, um, and also code that isn't tested. And refactoring is something that we're going to do a bit of. And what is refactoring? It is updating an existing code base, but in such a way that it doesn't actually change the application logic. You can use it to improve the code structure. And you usually approach it in very small incremental steps. Why would you refactor? To improve other developers' understanding of the code. That improves developer velocity, you get more done. You can also improve the application's performance. So for example, if you're changing an algorithm slightly so you achieve the same result, but in a more performant manner, you can use it to introduce new technology. For example, upgrading your applications to PHP 7. <laughs> and it also helps you to better accommodate changes in your code when things are just generally a bit more sane. Unit testing is also what I'm going to cover today. Unit testing is a verification that each individual unit of your application works as you intended it to. A unit, in the definition of a unit, would be a component part of your software application. So for example, um, a function or a piece of behavior. And just a small note here is that I am going to be talking about unit testing during this presentation, but unit testing is not a substitute for all other types of testing. There are lots of different ways to test your code and your application, and this is just one of them. So please bear this in mind. I love unit testing because it helps you to document your system. If you can look at the test and see what people intended to be happening in your application. It also helps you to prevent regressions. So if you change something in your code and it breaks something, your unit tests are hopefully going to alert you to that. You can also use unit tests to test integration with new technology. So for example, if you're upgrading your application. And it also helps you validate your product requirements. But there's a slight paradox when it comes to unit testing and legacy code in that you can't <coughs> write the tests for your code because it's legacy and it's untested and it's horrible and it's really difficult um, and you need to refactor it. But you can't refactor it either until it's tested because things could go wrong and it would be horrible. <laughs> so I've got a solution for you all. We're going to rewrite the entire code base. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a great idea. No, don't do that, <laughs> please. <laughs> that is a false economy. Um, I have a better solution for you all. Um, we're going to perform just enough refactoring on our existing code base so that we can make the code testable. Then we're going to write tests for our code, lather, rinse, repeat, and profit. We are at a PHP conference, so I'm going to make a few assumptions. I'm assuming that you're PHP developers and that you have access to a terminal with Composer. And I'm going to introduce a few tools. So, <clears throat> sorry. The main unit testing framework in the PHP ecosystem is PHP unit. Um, I didn't update this slide, but I believe PHP unit 9 is out now. But there are older versions. So even if your PHP code base happens to be particularly legacy, 5.6, for example, there are still versions that you can use. So you can still go and implement the techniques that I'm going to be explaining today. It's really easy to install if you have Composer. 
You want to do composer required dash dash dev because you don't need unit tests in production. Um, PHP unit, PHP unit, and then you can test that it works using vendor bin PHP unit dash dash version. Should give you the output display. So a unit test. For people that haven't done much unit testing before, I'll briefly explain what a unit test looks like. So a unit test is usually a class that extends the PHP unit base test case. And inside this test class, we have a group of functions. And each function is a test. And you usually have, for example, a class, a test class, that is testing one of your classes in your app, actual application. And then each function is testing each different behavior of that class. So in this example, we have example test that has one test in it, and it's to test the output or the result of some function. So within our test function, we're running the thing that we want to test, that's the underlined sum function, and we want to assert that when we do run that function, it returns the value of true. So if we were to run this test, hopefully we would get the correct output. And to run our tests, and I've put all of my tests in a directory called tests, so I'm doing vendor bin PHP unit tests to tell it where my tests are and you should run it. And you get a nice output. It's a little dot to say, yep, the test passed. Everything's working. Great. There's another thing that I want to introduce, and that it's mocking. Mocking is really useful in unit testing because it enables you to create test doubles. So if you're testing one particular part of your application, it probably is going to depend on other parts of your application because nothing really exists in a vacuum. Um, but you don't necessarily want to use real objects in your tests. It might have unintended consequences or behave strangely uh, or just be overly complex. So mocking allows you to create test versions of objects in your code. It helps you to verify the behavior regardless of what that test object is doing and isolates what it is exactly that you're trying to test. A bit of a caution when it comes to mocking. It's nice to mock dependencies when you need to, but try not to mock everything because your code does not exist in a vacuum. And sometimes you mock things and think the tests pass um, only because you've really told them to pass and not because they actually would in a real-world scenario. And that's the warning about tautological testing, um, which often happens if you were to mock the system under test. Please, under no circumstances, no matter how tempting it is, do this, because then you're not really testing anything. So PHP unit does have some mocking abilities built in already, but I prefer to use this um, library mockery. I find it easy to understand and to use. And you can install it again using Composer, Composer required dash dash dev mockery mockery, because hopefully you're not creating mock object in your application code. Um, and this is how you would create a test object using mockery. You do mockery, colon, colon, mock, and then pass it in the name of the class that you want to mock and it will create a version of that class with the correct types, so it will pass all your type printing, but it is actually a, just a dummy. And you can perform expectations on your mock objects. So in this instance, we're saying that at some point during the execution of our code, this mock object should receive a call to the method method. It should only receive a call to that method once, and when it does, it should always return the value true. This is not asserting on the return value of that method. We are telling it that it will return true. And that allows us to um, essentially force the flow of our application. When you're using mockery, you have to remember to close it. This is just a sort of a side thing. If, if you don't close your mockery after you've done it, it won't count the number of times that things have been called. And so you'll get failed tests. So just something to bear in mind. Just a disclaimer, the following examples 
are going to be deliberately simple. You're probably never going to see anything like this in your real application code. I've made them simple so that hopefully you can learn to identify the patterns that are going to be problematic when it comes to legacy code. Um, and when you've learned to identify them, you can apply the techniques that I will explain to you to tame your legacy code. So I'm going to go through a bunch of different, different scenarios. Legacy code. So um, the first tricky testing scenario that we're going to cover today is interfering output. And when I say interfering output, I mean something like an echo or a print in your code. So here we have a function yodel that if you pass it a tune, it will echo that tune back to you. Otherwise, it will just start its own little yodel. Great. So how are we going to test this? There are two possible branches to this. We can either test what well, we can test what happens when we don't give it something to echo, and we can test what should happen when we do give it something to echo. So we've created our new um, unit testing class, given it a name, and we've got our two methods in there. Each one is a different unit that it's testing. And in the first one, we're going to test our yodel without being passed any parameters. And then the second one, we're going to test the echo yodel. Sounds great. We're going to run these tests, and something weird happens. The output is actually in our test runner. There's also another thing to note here, is that it says there were two risky tests. Because if you notice in our example, we're not actually testing anything. We're just executing these methods. Nothing's actually being asserted. So that's why it's considered risky. So how do we deal with this kind of scenario? And, and just imagine for a moment that this you might encounter in an old application where you haven't really separated concerns. So for example, if you've got a render function that ends up printing an entire HTML page, and then you get that in your test runner, and it's very confusing and long. Yeah. So Anyway, first off, we're going to prevent that from happening. We're going to stop our output being like vomited out into our test runner for starters. We're going to try and capture that output so that we can actually perform assertions on our capture output. So PHP has the output <coughs> buffer, which we can start up using ob underscore start. And anything executed after this point, anything that is printed or echoed, will be captured by the output buffer. Um, and then we can sandwich it between ob end clean which is where it will say, OK, we don't, we're not interested in anything that's outputted after this point. And to get the contents of our output buffer, we're going to use ob get contents. And we're going to assign that to our variable output. And now we have something that we can actually assert on, because we've got a variable with some data in it. So we can use PHP unit and say this assert equals olay um, output, and our tests pass. Similarly, we can do the same thing for our other branch, our alternative branch, where we are passing it a yodel to echo back at us. We can assert on that value, and it is also successful and passes. Another thing, the second thing that you're probably likely to encounter in your legacy code is the static method calls. There are some reasons that people don't like static methods, and uh, the difficulty to test them is probably one of them. So anyway, we are Vegeta, and we have a scanner, and we've seen Goku, and we want to see what his power level is. And if his power level is over 9,000, we're going to be like, it's over 9,000. Otherwise, it's like, OK, he's suppressed fine. So this is our method, our get power level method, that gets the result of Goku's power level and returns the correct response. So again, we're going to create our test class. And we've got two possible scenarios here. Either Goku's power level is over 9,000, or it's not. So we're going to call power level, and you know, we're going to assert on the result of that. But if we actually look at Goku, the power level method, the static power level method on Goku, is always going to return 5,000, which means that this is fine. Because 5,000 is under 9,000, so he's always going to return 5,000, and it's going to be suppressed. 
But if we want to test the branch of it's over 9,000, then it's not going to work because it's never going to be over 9,000. So how do we deal with this kind of scenario? We're going to create a new mock Goku using mockery aliasing. I'll explain that in a minute. We're going to force the return value of Goku's power level to be 9,001, which is indeed over 9,000. And we're going to have to run our tests in separate processes. It's kind of a weird thing. I'll explain in a minute. So we're going to create our Super Saiyan Goku using mockery mock alias colon and then Goku's class name. The problem with aliasing is that it completely overrides the classes that already exist in your application. So you can only create an alias if your class hasn't already been loaded, for example, via auto-loading, which is why you can't use the um, colon colon class magic thing. You actually have to type the fully qualified name um, in the alias. Um, so here, yeah, we have a Super Saiyan Goku. We're going to say that at some point during the execution of this code, it's going to receive a call to power level. And when it does, it's going to return 9001. So yeah, now our test is successful. So we can, we've tested our two branches. So yeah, a note about using alias. Because it does override the classes in your application, it's kind of not recommended. Um, so yeah, and this is, this is from the uh, mockery documentation. It clearly says that even though it is supported that you probably shouldn't use it. So there, there, is, there are a couple of other ways to, uh, to, to solve this. But the problem that it's going to present you is that when you run your tests, it's probably going to complain that because you have some tests later that want to use the actual real class and not the class that you've created that's a mock. So it's going to complain, oh, this class already exists, you can't do anything. So what you'll end up doing is having to run the tests in your mocked class in a separate process and disable the global state so that it forgets that you've mocked the class after it runs this test suite, which is fine. It works, but it's very, very slow. So not great. But you know, if this gets you one step closer to testing your legacy code, then it's all good, right? The third thing that we're going to consider today is hard-coded dependencies, such as this. We're in Britain, I'm British, and my outlook on life depends a lot on what the weather is like, which is, to be fair, mainly grey and horrible. So I have a method here, get outlook, which creates a new weather forecast, and it looks at the weather forecast, and if it's sunny, then it feels like my glass is half full, I'm great. Um, otherwise, my glass feels like it's half empty and I'm kind of a pessimist, um, and it's going to return the value the glass is half empty or full, depending on what the weather forecast is. Great. The problem is, my weather forecast is just about as good as any real weather forecast, and it's pretty random. Sometimes it's sunny, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's correct, sometimes it's not. And uh, yeah, our sunny is sunny method returns a random <coughs> Boolean value. Great. But we want to test our two scenarios, whether our glass is half full or our glass is half empty. We need to get the result of our outlook um, and assert on that result. But half the time, these tests are going to pass, and half the time, they're going to fail, which isn't great, because <laughs> we kind of want our tests to be a bit consistent. And so yeah, we're going to look again to mockery, and we're going to mock our weather forecast using a mockery override this time, not alias. We're going to force the return value of is sunny to be true or false, depending on what branch that we want to test. And we can perform assertions based on those mocked return values. And again, we're going to have to look at running our tests in separate processes because mockery override intercepts a class on creation. So you would use an override for non-static methods when you're creating a hard-coded dependency on the fly. Um, but you would use alias for static methods because alias creates a whole new class and override intercepts an existing class and turns it into a mock. So here's mockery come in. We're going to use overload weather forecast. You can use the magic colon colon class thing in this. You don't have to type out the fully qualified name because it's an intercept rather than a creation of a class. Um, we're going to say that at some point it should receive a call to is sunny, and when it does, it should return true. 
And in that case, our glass should be half full. Great, that works. And again, the other way around, if we want to test the other branch, we're going to say, oh, it's going to return false, and our glass is half empty. Great. Um, but again, you're going to probably find that you're going to have to run your test in a separate process because there are probably other tests in your suite that are testing the forecast that you don't want to be mocked. So in order for them not to all be mocked, you need to run the test in a separate process, which is fine. It gets you moving on the way towards testing. Great, cool. Um, but it's, it's slow. So um, there's a better way. We can refactor this. Um, so we're going to refactor the code to use an injected dependency. We're going to mock that injected dependency, and we're going to inject the mocked dependency. And then we can remove that annotation. So he who here has heard of dependency injection? Almost everyone. OK, who can confidently explain what dependency injection is? A few of you. OK. Right, so I'm going to demystify this for you. Here we have our get outlook and our new weather forecast. This is a hard-coded dependency because we are creating the dependency within our actual method. Instead, we can inject our dependency using dependency injection. That is creating a dependency outside of our method and passing it in just via a parameter. And that is the essence of dependency injection. Dependency injected. Now you know. <laughs> So in this case, this is a safe refactor because I've given it a default parameter value of null. And then in our next line, when I'm getting the weather forecast, I can either use the dependency that has been injected or I can do what it was doing already anyway. So the behavior hasn't actually changed. We can just create a new weather forecast on the fly if one is not being passed. This means you don't need to go through your whole application and change all of the signatures to this method. It just works and we've got our dependency injection in place. So in our tests, it means we can create a mock of our weather forecast. We don't need to use overload anymore. We can just give it the class name and create a whole new mocked class. And that leaves all the other creators of this class untouched, which is great. We're going to say it should receive a sunny and return true, and we're going to inject that dependency into our get outlook method. And hooray, this works, and we don't need this anymore. <laughs> cool. That solved. There's another thing that you commonly encounter in legacy code, and those are ungraceful exits. And the first kind of ungraceful exit I want to uh, explain and demonstrate today is uh, <laughs> the redirect. <laughs> so um, you're the Knights of the Round Table, and you want to enter the cave, cave analog, but there is a rabbit, killer rabbit with you. Or there may or may not be a killer rabbit with lusty pointy teeth. Um, <laughs> so if you do encounter a killer rabbit, you're going to run away. Um, but if you don't, then cool, behold, we're going to enter the cave, cave analog. Cool. So again, we have our two branches to this. You can either enter the cave safely, there's no killer rabbit, you're good, or there is a killer rabbit there and you're going to have to run away, you're going to have to redirect. But when you run these tests, or when you run these methods in these tests, you're going to quickly find that it, everything goes a bit weird because there's a header change in there, um, because the redirect is, at, is setting a header. So you find that you need to run it in a separate process just so that it, it doesn't confuse the entire test suite. So that's, that's one thing. Um, so when we try to enter our cave of cave panel safely and there's no rabbit there, it's pretty simple because nothing, nothing redirects us. We just continue with the execution in the function and um, behold, yeah, it returns correctly. But we want to assert that when there is a killer rabbit in the way, that we don't get behold. But the odd thing is, in this scenario, that we do. That's because in a test runner, we don't have any headers or redirection or things like that in place. So if we go back to our method, it gets to the killer rabbit. It goes, OK, I'm going to redirect. But it doesn't, because it's in a console. It's a test runner. It's not going to do it. And then it continues with the execution, and it returns behold still. This would 
This wouldn't happen if you were running this in a browser because you would get redirected and the execution would stop. But in the test runner, it does. So we need to remember that if we're anticipating that a user is going to be re redirected or the execution is going to stop, that we actually make the execution stop. That is to um, put return or continue or break or whatever it is to exit the execution of your method after redirecting. Or you could technically get the header and put it right at the end of your methods so that there's nothing that it could potentially do after that point. So this is safe refactor in that the actual behavior of the method hasn't changed because after you've been redirected, it would have, ex it would have stopped execution anyway. So this is a way that you can make your tests work and everything is sane or the other way around, return early. Um, so the header is the very last step and you don't continue executing something and get unintended consequences. Cool, and we're inserting that when there is a killer rabbit in the way that we don't get behold, we don't get to enter the cave and <laughs> we run away. There's another type of ungraceful exit. <laughs> you know what's coming. <laughs> so we, um, we have Brexit. We have our Brexit method. And if we're a Remainer, we're going to say bollocks to Brexit. And if we're not, we're going to exit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we want to test <laughs> our two branches of this method, e method. Either we're a Brexiter and the result is that we're going to exit, we're going to crash and burn and everything's going to be horrible, or we're a Mainer and everything will be fine. <laughs> so in our test Remainer function, we have a Brexit. Our Remainer is true. And we're going to assert that the result of that function is that it says bollocks to Brexit. Cool, successful. But when we're a Brexiter, and we run this method, um, and we want to assert the result is empty, it never gets there, because exit does completely exit whatever your execution path is. It completely exits the test runner. So we need to think about refactoring this so that we can get this tested. I like to create a wrapper around that exit functionality to remove it from the method. And then we can inject that wrapper and um, mock it. So that we're going to create sort of a fake Brexit um, with a bit of safe refactoring using our magical dependency injection. So here's our wrapper around Brexit. It's Boris. <laughs> and he's going to get Brexit done. <laughs> and he's going to completely exit. Cool. Fine. And we have our Brexit method, and we're going to pass in our Boris dependency. And again, we're going to give it a default value of null, because this is a safe refactor. We won't need to change any of our calls to Brexit, um, because it will use a null value. And if the value is null, it will go and create a new Boris on the fly. So yeah, you don't have to change any of your existing code. Um, and instead of exiting, we're just going to be Boris, and we're going to get Brexit done. So cool, in our test Brexit method, we're going to create a mocker Boris, which is always fun. Um, and we're just going to make him do nothing. He's just going to sit there and be silly. Um, and then we're going to, well, we've got to make sure that our first parameter to Brexit remainder is false. And we're going to pass in the mocked Boris. And yay, this works. Um, don't try and unit test Boris, because all he does is exit, and it would be kind of pointless. And I know that means that you're not going to have 100% coverage, but it's just kind of a trade-off that you have to make when it comes to testing legacy code. This is another thing that you're going to encounter, probably, in legacy code and in code in general, to be fair, interaction with the file system. So we're going to take a trip back to the 90s. I remember but we had all those web pages on like GeoCities, and they had all the animated GIFs and stuff like that, and also um, a hit counter, because it was very important to show, pe show people um, how many people actually visited your website. So this is our hit counter, our hit counter method, which counts hit. And we have a hit counter file. 
we're going to read the contents of that hit counter file, and then we're going to increment it by one and save that back. Cool. We want to test this. Um, so we test count hit. Um, we need to find the contents of that file before we count a hit. So that's where we're getting our count before. We're going to count the hit. We're going to get the contents again, and then assert that the value after a hit has been counted is equal to one plus the count prior to that. But there's some problems with this, because you're artificially inflating your hit count. Uh, and that would be frowned upon, because every time you run your test, you're actually um, incrementing the value in that file. Um, so that gets kind of annoying and interfering, and yeah, it just looks like way more popular than you actually are. So we're gonna have to refactor this as well. And again, we're gonna return to our trusty dependency injection, and instead of hard coding the file name, which is a dependency, we're going to inject that. And we're going to create a test double hit counter file. And we're going to reset the contents of that file after each test just to keep it clean and make sure you don't end up with a file with like a gazillion hits. Just a bit, a bit simpler. So here is our dependency injection at work again. We have a file parameter, and we're going to give it a default value equal to the value that was already in the file. So that we can either give it a new file name to use, for example, the test file, or we'll just use the file name that was already in there anyway. Cool. So instead of using our actual hit counter file in our tests, we're going to use test hit counter text, which is a test version of our hit counter. We're going to inject that dependency, and everything works. In our teardown, we're going to do just file put contents and um, reset our counter to zero. In theory, we could just assert previously that the count would always be one after running this method, because if it has a zero in it to begin with, then re resetting the contents after each um, test run, then it's always going to be one. So it kind of simplifies things a bit. But there's a better way. Because with this, you're maintaining a test hit counter file, which kind of clutters things up. It's a bit messy. You have to make sure that's committed and make sure no one changes the value of it. Um, so yeah, there's another way. And I'm going to introduce a tool today called uh, BFS Stream, which creates a fake or virtual file system. So instead of doing this test hit counter file, we can create a new virtual file stream using VFS stream, colon, colon, setup. And then we can create a new hit counter file using VFS stream new file, give it a file name, tell it where it wants to put it, which is in the virtual file stream, and we're going to set the contents of that file. And then instead of a string file name, we can pass it hit counter file URL which behaves in the same way as um, a file name to any other file on your system, but it's virtual. And we can always assert that it's going to equal one after we've counted a hit, because it's setting the contents to zero before each test run. So yeah, that's uh, quite handy. We can just get rid of this stuff now. We don't need it. Makes things a bit simpler. Everyone has spaghetti, right? Just maybe not in your code base. <laughs> so, yeah, spaghetti code, that's, that, that's the thing that you're going to encounter. OK, so I have a bolognese. Um, and, and for some reason, well, OK, I have a bolognese. It can be either eaten or not. My plate's full or it's not. Um, I can eat the bolognese. And I can check whether or not the bolognese has already been eaten. Um, and it also has parmesan. Um, and looking into our eat method, if we've already eaten a bolognese, we can't eat it again, obviously. That would be weird. Um, if it doesn't have Parmesan cheese on it, or if I've eaten the Parmesan cheese on it, I want more Parmesan on my bolognese because I quite like Parmesan and it doesn't taste right without it. Um, but also, I need to have garlic bread with my bolognese because it's not bolognese with the garlic bread, right? OK, so I've got to have the garlic bread. And if I'm eating the bolognese, I'm going to eat the garlic bread as well. And if I'm eating the bolognese, I'm going to eat the parmesan as well. Uh, and then it's going to say eaten to be true. This is a bit weird because um, it's spaghetti. And I'm not sure why spaghetti is concerned about whether or not I'm also eating garlic bread or, or parmesan cheese, to be fair. Um, so yeah, this is, this is literal spaghetti code. There are lots of dependencies in there. It's all kind of intermingled. No one really knows what's going on. No one really knows what to expect. Um, 
So if we want to test something like this, we create our bolognese test file, and we want to test what happens when we eat the bolognese. So we're going to create a new bolognese, and we're going to eat it. And yeah, this works. We're going to assert that after we've eaten our bolognese, that it is indeed eaten. But there are a few <laughs> tricky things about this. Because when you test something like that, it does execute all of the code in there. So it's going to look like in your test coverage that we've also covered a bit of Parmesan and a bit of garlic bread, which is a bit misleading. So there's a covers annotation in PHP unit, which you can use to specify what it is exactly that you intended to test. So when it comes to spaghetti code, you can tell it that actually, although you've executed this function, which has had a ton of side effects because everything's tangled up, that I had only intended to test the bolognese. And it will discard the coverage for everything else that it's come into contact with. I also like to create reusable expectations. So for example, I might illustrate different process branches or scenarios um, that occur in multiple times, or I want to test multiple times in the spaghetti code. I think I'm trying to see I'm trying to spell. So yeah, here I've added the handy covers annotation. So when I eat the bolognese, I'm telling it that I only actually intended to test the bolognese class and not everything else that seems to come with it. And um, I want to test now that when I try to eat a bolognese that's already been eaten, that it can't be eaten again. And I also want to test that when I eat a bolognese that hasn't already been eaten, that the correct behaviors occur. So here are two tests, bolognese that's already been eaten and one that hasn't. When I run these tests, I kind of want to check that when I'm eating a bolognese that hasn't been eaten, that I also eat garlic bread. So I've created a private function in my unit test class, which is expect garlic bread to be eaten, which creates a mock of garlic bread and overload because it's a hard-coded dependency. Um, and I'm going to say that if I am, garlic bread should be eaten. So that I can use this expect garlic bread to be eaten elsewhere in my test. So when I'm eating a bolognese that hasn't yet been eaten, I don't want to expect to eat garlic bread. But when I am eating an uneaten bolognese, I do expect to also be eating garlic bread. And that's just sort of one way of taming the spaghetti code whilst you attempt to refactor it a bit. Cool. <laughs> Another thing that you're likely to encounter in any code is the private method. So I have MC Hammer here. <laughs> and when you say stop, he's going to say can't touch this. And that's going to return hammer time. So cool, we can test can't touch this. We're going to create a new MC Hammer. We're going to call can't touch this. And when that, is, when that happens, we're going to assert that it returns the result hammer time. But we can't, we get an error, because can't touch this is a private method. So how are we supposed to test this? Well, don't. Just leave it. Test the public methods that use the private methods. So they get tested by proxy. That counts. That's absolutely fine. Private methods are, as they say, private. They are implementation details. You shouldn't really care about them anyway. So yeah, feel free to ignore those. So instead, we're going to test stop. And indeed, that calls can't touch this, which indeed returns hammer time. And our tests are successful, and there are no errors. Great. So to recap, I've explained a bunch of scenarios that you're likely to encounter in your work with legacy code. Um, hopefully, you will be able to recognize some of these patterns and understand some of the techniques that you can employ to get these tested. And once you've got them tested, you can refactor happily, safely. Nothing's going to go wrong. Legacy code is not something that you should fear or need to fear. Legacy code is an asset. Legacy code is what you are being paid to maintain, and you didn't have to write it. 
And now, hopefully, you understand you don't need to rewrite it either. Thank you. <laughs>